prayer, ministering prayer. I, I've actually, you know, had on different occasions to do the tongues and interpretations and prophetic gifts. Uh, God is speaking to me about teaching prayer, equipping people to pray. Uh, so I just kind of been digging into God's word, looking into that stuff, and, and that's what I want to do today is just continue teaching about prayer. And uh, just some real simple things about prayer today, some real basic things about prayer, but some things that normally uh, maybe we wouldn't look at. It sounds like some topic. I just said it properly. Uh, the book of Philippians, chapter 4, and I'm going to be looking at verses 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. Verse 7 tells us what happens then. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we're talking about as a result of our prayer life, the peace of God shall keep our minds and our hearts. That word keep there means protect and guard. And so through our prayer life, our hearts and our minds can be protected and guarded from the chaos in this world. Our hearts and our minds can be protected from, from just, you know, this world just falling apart. You know, and we're going to look into that a little bit probably today. There's a direct connection in some scriptures about prayer and the last days. We know the Bible tells us that in the last days, men's hearts are going to fail them because of fear. So these are troubled times. We know the Bible talks about in the last days are going to be perilous times. So these are troubled times. So we need to understand in troubled times, how do we live in peace? Because if the times are troubled, the world's crazy, how do we live in peace? And, the, and a lot of people are trying to solve that problem. And a lot of people are trying to do it with drugs, whether legal or illegal. They're trying to do it with alcohol. They're trying to do it with, you know, this or that. They're trying to find different ways to give their heart peace. And the Bible tells us very specifically here that that's a result of prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Amen. And so that's what I've kind of been examining a little bit is just that basic idea. And I don't know how far we're going to go as far as teaching a series on prayer, but I, the Lord has just put it in my heart to go to certain scriptures that talk about prayer and just examine them a little bit. So we're going to look here at Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything. We got that far last week. Be careful for nothing, but in everything. So now we're that, that to the next two words, by prayer. By prayer. And I, and I, I want to just start with some really simple, basic teaching. And I shared before, when it comes to the scriptures, I'm kind of an oddball, I guess. I ask God questions. And I want to know things and understand things. So I would ask God simple questions. Why should I pray? Why should I pray? Why should we pray? Hey, you might say, you know, you might come up with a, a lot of different answers to that, but why should you pray? We know that God tells us to pray, but what is accomplished when we pray? Why should we pray? You know, I remember uh, there was a gentleman, oh, I don't know, a couple, three years ago, I was having a conversation with him, and uh, we began to talk about the things of God. And he shared this great thought with me. He says, you know, he says, I, I think I could go out there and I could stand in the traffic. And, and uh, he was trying to prove a point to me in theology. And he says, I could stand in traffic there and have a car run over me. And if it wasn't my time to die, I wouldn't go. My thought says, why don't you prove it to me? <laughs> Show me. Go stand out in front of the traffic. Show me. You see, obviously that person who thinks everything is, is that much of a fatalist thing in this world, if you truly believe that everything that happens, God caused it to happen, why would you pray? Because it's not going to change anything. And I would ask that person who thinks that, well, why would you pray? If, if God's already ordained everything and everything's already predestined and everything's already set in stone, why would I pray? It's not going to change anything. You see, there, what I've always heard, you've heard me use the phrase case of Ross, Ross theology, whatever is to be, will be. Well, that person who believes that is not going to be much of a prayer. Why? Because they don't believe it has any impact on anything. So if my prayer life doesn't affect anything, if my prayer life doesn't change anything, why would God want me to pray? Everybody's will just spend a little bit. Y'all looking at me kind of like, what's he talking about? Go to Ezekiel 
chapter 22. If we're going to bounce around and look at some scriptures that deal with prayer, Ezekiel 22, verse 30 and 31. Now, to the person who has that idea of God, that person who has that idea that God does whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it, and it doesn't matter what we do, this scripture is going to shock them. To the person who thinks that that's the way God set this universe up, this scripture is a stumbling block to that theology. Because God very plainly and very simply, right here in the scripture, says the exact opposite. Ezekiel 22, verses 30 and 31. And I saw for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Now that verse tells us that God was looking for somebody to pray. God was looking for somebody to intercede for the land. And as a result, he could not find anybody. And because he could not find somebody to pray for the land, something happened that God was looking for somebody to change. Look at verse 31. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Notice where verse 30. Let's look at this again. We're going to chew on this for just a second. I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for that land, that I should not destroy it. In other words, God is saying, I'm looking for somebody who will pray so that I will not destroy this land. The next verse says, but since I couldn't find one, I destroyed the land. So apparently, our prayers have a big, big impact on what happens. God is saying here, I sought for somebody to be an intercessor. I sought for somebody to stand in the gap and to pray for this land so I would not have to destroy this land, but since I couldn't find anybody, I had to go ahead and pass judgment upon this land. I could not find anybody to pray. You might say, Pastor, that seems far fetched. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Very familiar scripture. I'm going to just quicken this scripture to my heart to, to read this. Because you're all kind of looking at me like, ah, I don't know about all that. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. It says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Notice that verse begins with the word if. If God's people humble themselves, pray, seek his face, and turn from their wicked ways, God will heal the land. If God's people don't do that, what would be the natural result? God won't heal the land. God wouldn't heal the land. So what I'm saying here is our, our prayer life is very important. As God's children, as God's people, our prayer life is very important. Your prayer life has a lot more to say about things than you can possibly imagine. So we have to examine ourselves and ask ourselves, what's our prayer life like? Am I listening to God? If God was seeking for somebody to stand in the gap as he was in the book of Ezekiel, would I hear his call and know how to pray and to get before God and to do that? Well, Pastor, you don't understand. We're too busy. That's probably what they said back then, too. <coughs> Hallelujah. It's just beautiful thought. God sought for a man. God sought for a man. God sought for a man. You see, if you'll stop and think for a moment, and I know this goes contrary to our thinking sometimes, because in our thinking, you know, God just does what he wants to, when he wants to, and how he wants to. But according to the scriptures I just read, that's not true, is it? God didn't want to destroy that land because he was seeking for a man who would stand in the gap and pray so that it wouldn't happen. God gave a promise in 2 Chronicles that 
that goes today. If, if, if we will... If we will hear God's voice and we will humble ourselves and, and we will pray and we will seek His face and turn from our wicked ways, God will heal this land. But if God's people don't, what's the result? I mean, I mean it, it also says if God's people just stand here, we complain about the politicians and we watch this land go down the tubes. If my people who are called by my name should humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal the land. So can I put it to you bluntly? The fate of this nation is in the hands of Christian's prayer life, not in the hands of the President of the United States. The fate of this nation is in the hand of the, of the Christian's prayer life, not in the hands of Congress. Not in the hands of the Senate. Not in the hands of the governor. Not in the hands of the mayor. I, 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 I hesitate to share something because I, I don't want to sound goofy. If I say you sound goofy all the time, Pastor, what's the problem? <laughs> I have to feel like that's got the funny thing you're going to say, isn't it? <laughs> I don't want to sound arrogant. I mean, that way to
spoke to Paul and sought him out. God appeared to the prophet Isaiah, sought him out, and sent him to the nation. God is a seeking God. You know, there's something else very fascinating about this point. God was sought for a man. And because he couldn't find that man, devastation followed. God uses human vessels. And that's an amazing thing sometimes to really stop and consider. I mean, we, what we pray for, God will answer through a human. God, do this or do that. God uses human vessels. You can go clear back to the early parts of the Old Testament. And when the Israelites were in bondage, they began to cry out to God because of the oppression that was upon them. And what did God do? God answered their prayers, didn't he? How did he answer their prayers? He sent them a man. He called a man named Moses and called him out in the very next chapter and called him out, appeared to him in a burning bush, spoke to him, called him out and said, you go speak to Pharaoh. God sought for a human vessel. You see, beloved, one of the, the things that has hindered the body of Christ so much is this idea that we as God's people can sit on our hands and just wait for God to show up and do something. I bet the Israelites were glad Moses didn't have that theology. I bet the Israelites were really glad that Moses hearkened to the call and Moses obeyed God even though he debated with him, even though he argued with him. Moses obeyed God and he went out and he spoke to the Pharaoh and we know the stretch of miracles that took, followed that, the stretch of the miracles that took place after that. And we know what went on at that point in time because a man answered that call, God used a human vessel to set the Israelites free from the bondage. You see, there's a lot there to look at. God did the same thing with the Apostle Paul. He sent them to a people who were spiritually blind. He sent them to a people who were spiritually deaf. He sent them to a people who were in spiritual bondage. To proclaim the gospel that they would be set free. People were crying out to God and God sent a human vessel. It's kind of interesting to note that before God called Moses, there was a people in bondage crying out, calling out to him, and a people at that point in time, God sent Moses, we see that Paul, that there was a people crying out, God sent Paul. It seems to me that if we examine the word of God, it might be that the call upon our life has something to do with the needs surrounding us, and the reason God is speaking to our hearts and calling us into prayer is because there's a community of people saying, oh God, help me, oh God, oh God, where are you at, oh God, why? And God's lifting up a people. All the prayers for this community, God will answer through human vessels. Paul seen Jesus on the road of blind. God sent a human vessel to pray for him. But he could see. And he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why wouldn't Paul sit there think, well, God wants me to see, God will heal me? God worked through human vessels. I sought for a man. You see, when he sought for a man there, nobody answered that call. And as a result of nobody answering that call, there was devastation. But there's other times in the Word of God where we can see that God, people did answer the call. And God tur turned judgment away. There was a time in now. The Israelites, when they were delivered, Moses went up on the mountaintop talking to God. While he's gone, what did they do? They didn't know a big golden calf and they were worshiping. And they know they get a big golden calf. They begin to worship it. God's talking up there, talking to Moses. Said, Moses, you need to go back down. You need to go back down. And you need to deal with them. And Moses went back down. God's using a human vessel. 
And when Moses went back down, Moses seen the situation, God said, that's it, I'm wiping them out. I had it, I put up, I put out with them, I'm going to do, wipe them out. And you know what happened? Moses interceded for those people. And as a result of Moses' intercession, God stayed his hand and did not pass judgment upon them. You see, it was the exact opposite of Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 30 and 31. God sought for a man, a man answered, and judgment was stayed. Because of the prayers of a man. Maybe that goes contrary to your theology and your doctrine. But it's Bible. It's word. It's reality. Why pray? Because, my friends, the hands of the nation is in your hands. Why pray? Because the lost and dying are dependent upon your prayers. Why pray? Because the community is dependent upon it. Not only that, it gives you peace. It gives you joy. All the, the, the benefits that come as a result of our prayer life. We'll get into that. But beloved, the body of Christ has spent too much time complaining about the devastation and too little time interceding about it. We can complain about the country all we want and accomplish nothing. We can get in our prayer closets and change the course of a nation. Let me go to that. Answered prayer is a tremendous witness to a lost and dying world. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Do you remember Elijah? When he kind of challenged the prophets of Baal to a, a prayer contest, I guess you'd call it, a prayer fight. And we all know the, 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 the situation most of us do in the scriptures. There was a time when uh, Elijah spoke to the, the false prophets and, and challenged him to a, a, a prayer showdown. I said, basically, you guys are going to pray to your God, and if your God will come down and consume that offering with fire, he'll be God and we'll worship him. But I'm going to pray to my God, and if my God will come down and consume that offering with fire, we'll know who the true God is. We'll know who the real God is. And of course, we know they got up there, probably the bell, they called it again. Elijah said, you guys go first. You go first. And they start crying out that they're a false god, cutting themselves and doing all the stuff that people do who are into that, and, and howling, and carrying on. You know, Elijah, he was all right. I kind of like Elijah. He's trash talking the whole time. Like, hey, maybe your god's asleep and can't hear you. Maybe he's deaf. And all said and done, Elijah steps up and he says, yeah, go ahead and just surround that all the day and drink that so it's hard to catch him on fire. Very simply, he said, Lord, show them that it's your word I did this. Whew! The fire of God came down and consumed that sacrifice. You see, that answered prayer was a witness to people who were bordering on the valley of decision. Turn to the one true God. You know, as I was reading, I just remember a, a couple experiences I had before I was a Christian. And one was I, had, I was talking to a guy who was a preacher, and I was just humoring the man. He said, You know, is there anything I can pray for you about? Whatever. You know, yeah, sure, pray for me to get a job. I didn't have a job this time. Well, the next morning, somebody called that hired me. And I'll never forget that. There's something inside me. I knew, wait a second, that, that was an answer to that prayer. And the guy who hired me was a Christian. I thought, you know, I didn't respond to it, fall down on my knees and say, God, I'm yours, or anything like that. Time. But I knew then that that was an answer to prayer, and that was a testimony to the reality of Jesus Christ. And I seen that same thing with that man who hired me. I seen the same thing one day. We were out, we were working, the weather was getting nasty. He says, I'm going to pray that God will hold this weather off. I think, whatever. He stopped right there and he prayed to God that he'd change his weather, hold his weather off, and it cleared up. You see, I was an unbeliever. But both of those instances, I saw something. I saw that God was real. 
to the prayer lives of individuals. You see, beloved, answered prayer is a tremendous testimony to the reality of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Does our prayer life witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? There was another time that Elijah prayed for a widow's son. God raised him from the dead. She said, Whoo, I know you're a prophet now. I know your words are true. Tremendous witness to the power of God. You say, but wait a second, that's Elijah. I mean, my goodness, you can't be comparing us to Elijah. You can't be comparing yourself to Elijah. You can't be comparing this bunch to Elijah. I mean, we can't pray and see these miraculous things happen because like Elijah did. Well, guess what? I picked Elijah specifically to answer that question for you. Turn your Bible to James chapter 5. James specifically, so when that question rolled up, he said, yeah, not me. Not me, preacher. James chapter 5. Let's begin at verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you might be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Verse 17. Elias, that's the Greek for Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and rain not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth his fruit. You notice how verse 17 begins there? Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. In other words, what's the point that God's making there? If Elijah can do this with his prayer life, you can do that with your prayer life. There's no difference. The only difference is we got more understanding than Elijah did. What do you mean? He was a prophet. He was an Old Testament prophet. He didn't have a New Testament. Hallelujah. He didn't have the revelation that you and I have. He wasn't baptized in the Holy Ghost. Luke chapter 18. We're moving on. Luke chapter 18. Why pray? Because we can shake a world with our prayer life. We can shake a city, we can shake a state, we can shake a nation, we can shake a planet. Isn't it odd that something so powerful is so often neglected by the church? God says, here, I've given you the ability to shake your city. Man, no, oh, Pastor, we just don't have prayer meetings anymore because nobody comes. Ain't that crazy? But I told you, you know what, I, I'm going to give you a million dollars to put your bank in your name and your account. He called me up a month later, Pastor, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just got kicked out of my house because I didn't pay rent. You know, one of the things that, as a pastor, 
you sometimes have a different perspective of things than you may have as an individual. And, and what I mean by that is, I'll see how things will happen sometimes. And I will see things sweep through a congregation. That, you know, maybe you think, well, Pastor, I got this problem, and, and I'm just really struggling with it, and, and your church attendance really kind of begins to decline, and some of the things in your walk begins to decline, and you think, well, I'm really going through a battle. But as a pastor, I, you, you see that as a whole sometimes. I mean, there's times that I see as, as a church go through things as a whole. I see this person going through this, this person going through this, this person going through this, and this person going through this, and this person going through this, and this person going through this, and, going through this, and I realize, wow, there's a spiritual attack going on here. And it's not just the enemy messing with somebody, but there's an attack not only upon an individual, but upon a church. And you can see that in the body of Christ as a whole sometimes. You see, beloved, that's what fainting is. Those times when you, I mean, let me put it this way. This is, this is not for you to answer. This is uh, just a question for us to examine our own hearts between us and God. But don't answer me this, please, because I don't, the reason I always tell you that is because I don't want a religious answer. And there's things that people will always answer because they're in church. So they always answer things a certain way. Um, but was there ever a time in your life when you were spiritually stronger than you are now? And if you say, well, yeah, I'm not sure there was, but I want to get your attention for a second, okay? You're faint. You're in spiritual decline. And that's a very dangerous thing. We can never be casual or careless about spiritual decline. Well, I know, Pastor, I'm just not getting to church like I should, not my word like I should, not praying like I should. I know, Pastor, I fly, woo, I've never had to feel fire for Jesus, woo, glory to God. But I just, you're in trouble, friend. You were dying spiritually and laughing about it. You were fading. Spiritual decline. You know, the enemy doesn't attack us by just running up and saying, yeah, I want to get you. It's a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. <coughs> very subtly, very slowly, very casually. And the next thing you know, you think, wow, I can't remember the last time. I can't remember the last time I was in work. You know what? I remember back in, in 1992, I used to tell people about Jesus, but I can't remember the last time I did that. You think, well, I can deal with that. <clears throat> Lack of zeal. That's why sometimes you will see me as a pastor enter into seasons of prayer. And a lot of times it's not just for me, it's for you. Why you'll see me sometimes and, 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 and preach very challenging messages because I see decline. And I know it's a dangerous thing. And we can't allow it to happen. We can't faint. We can't go weak. You see, we talk about the parable of the sore often. It, the enemy throws things at us, afflictions and persecutions and cares of this world and, and lust for other things and, and, and deceitfulness of riches and, and all those things are designed to get the believer to faint. To just give up. Say, Lord, I just can't do this anymore. I'm tired, Lord. We're in danger of fainting. You see, we've got to understand that I don't have a but this is very serious, beloved. Then we have that whoo, Holy Ghost break for the moment here. And we hear from God. And understand the enemy's devices. I know this is going back a long time ago, and probably most of you don't know who I'm talking about. How many of you know who Rocky Marciano is? Raise your hand. We got a couple of them. Okay. Not Marciano, Marciano. The difference. Rocky Marciano was my dad's favorite boxer. I mean, he was my dad's hero when he came to boxing. So I used to give him pretty all the time, pick up Rocky Marciano just to get him going. <laughs> and uh, Rocky Marciano actually retired undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. The only man that's ever done that. Uh, but Rocky Marciano 
had an odd strategy as a boxer. And it, it really was very simple. But he, he just about knocked out, out, out about everybody here ever fought. And I don't know what the, the numbers are now, but just about everybody here ever fought, he knocked out. I mean, I don't know if he ever won a decision. But his strategy was when he was out there boxing in the early rounds, was to hit you in the arms. Hit your arms. And I mean, you think, well, what, what good does that do? Well, you let that guy beat you in the arms for about 10 rounds and see how you feel. Because what happens after you lose your arms? That's it. That's boxer's only weapons. That's all he has. And when those are gone, you're gone. It's over. You can't block. You can't punch. You can't do nothing except stand and knock you out. Wow. Very subtle strategy. Very few people caught what he was doing. And that's how the enemy works. He doesn't come in and just instantly try to overpower you. He tries to get you to faint. A little bit weaker, a little bit weaker, a little bit weaker, a little bit weaker, and then suddenly it's the 10th round. And he says, I'm going to take you out now. You see, spiritual decline is very dangerous. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'll roll here. We're talking about prayer, and you're talking about all this crazy stuff. This is all stuff that's very, very relevant to our prayer life. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse sixteen. How do we not think? The apostle Paul is pretty rough. On and if you examine his life, he, he went through some stuff. I mean, like most of us probably never had. As far as, you know, being beat, stolen, thrown in jail, you know, anything abuse that that person could receive, he received at some point or another. And, uh, but he kept on. And he never fainted. He understood how to do that. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. For which cause we faint not. Well, how do you not think going through all this up the door? Outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed how often? Day by day. day, by day. Yeah. Spiritual decline means you're not being renewed day by day. The way to stay out of spiritual decline is to be renewed day by day. You say, how, how, how do you do that? Well, well, there's a, a couple ways that the Bible tells us. And, and one of those is, is in our prayer life. And one of the funny things is, is once the prayer life starts declining, then you're not being renewed, and the prayer life declines, you're not being renewed, and the prayer life declines, and you're not being renewed, and the prayer life declines. And you don't have the energy to get out of the spiritual world. The Bible says that the Word of God is food, too. Why did Jesus say, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? If we don't eat and we don't drink spiritually, we're going to faint. And those of you who have been through these battles know what I'm talking about. Those times when you think, well, you know what? Yeah, I haven't been praying. I haven't been in the Word. Did you ever notice that the longer you go, the harder it is to get right again? So lack of prayer is a serious matter. Look at, let's go back to Luke 18. And I'll probably wind it down here. No, I can't be too long. Luke chapter 18, verse number 8. Luke chapter 18, verse 8. And this is all part of the same passage. And, and we know in Luke chapter 18, it started out with the Son of Man finding, well, we, we ought to always pray and not faith. And he goes on to talk about the lady who's persevering and, and in front of the judge. And then it comes down to verse 8, says, I tell you that, talk about this judge, he will avenge them speedily. <clears throat> Nevertheless, now look how Jesus applies the parable. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? 
So he takes this and tells us that men should always pray and not think that he teaches about the lady going before the judge and, and persevering. And then he asks the question, but when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? In other words, he's making a direct connection between fainting and the last days. You see, beloved, that's the one thing that maybe we have to kind of get some kind of realization of, of the time we are living in, as the Bible says, is perilous times. So let me ask you this, is perilous times a good time to be in spiritual decline? Probably not. Matter of fact, it says that in the last days, many shall depart from the faith. Is that a good time to be in spiritual decline? And, and the reason I'm pointing at this and, and, and I've applied this to my life as much as I've applied it to your life right now. And it seems to me that what the Word is telling us here, that if our prayer life is lacking, then we're in a dangerous place spiritually. And it seems to me that if the, if the body of Christ, if the church's prayer life is lacking, in perilous times, in dangerous times, then it's really dangerous times. And this is not something we can just take lightly. This is not something that we can just casually think, well, yeah, I'm not supposed to pray for. I, I, I think it's very important <coughs> that we understand the importance of our prayer life. And I think it's very important that we understand the importance of knowing how to pray. And more and more as I dig into these scriptures, I'm getting an understanding of why God's been speaking to me about prayer so much. And I, I'm getting an understanding why I, I, by the Spirit of God has been moving in my life in so many different ways and shapes, calling me to teach people to pray. Because, beloved, this, this, is, this is 911 urgent. Judgment day moment. We need to examine our prayer lives and make sure it's intact. And if, we, if we're laughing and we're declining, we need to deal with it. If you're declining spiritually, I, I'm sorry if I seem like I'm beating people up. I can't get off of it. And I really didn't intend on taking this message this direction. Uh, early this morning as I was praying, it just it, the Lord kept speaking to me about the danger of spiritual decline. Mm -hmm. And, 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 it, and, it, and if, if you're spiritually not where you were, if sometime in the past you were spiritually stronger than you are today, you are declining. And trust me, you need to deal with it. It needs to be dealt with. Because it only gets, you only decline more and decline more and decline more and decline more till the day comes when you don't want to hear about God. It doesn't just automatically change. Boom! Okay, well, yeah. Okay, things are different now. I just need to want something, Pastor. We make a choice. We make a choice. I'm not going to allow this to happen anymore in my life. I'm going to be all that God wants me to be. I'm going to walk with Him as close as I can walk with Him. I'm going to be as strong as I can be. Kind of like, when is the army be all you can be? God's army, be all you can be. Amen? Amen. Let me look at one more thing. Chapter 11, verse 13. Two quick points, and I'm going to wind down. We're still looking at my prayer. Prayer is the means that a believer taps into the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll say, no prayer, no power. And how do you understand that? Well, the Bible tells me that. There is a, again, when Jesus was teaching on prayer, he had just went through the uh, Lord's Prayer, this is after the disciples have asked to teach in the prayer, and then he went on about telling a, a parable about an individual who went and knocked on somebody's door and was needing bread, and the person said, you know, I, I, I'm asleep, I'm in bed, leave me alone. He said, because he was his friend, he wouldn't give him any bread. But then he kept knocking, hey, hey, I need some bread! Come on now, give me some bread! And he went on saying, because of his importunity, because of his importunity, he gave him bread. 
And then Jesus, how sometimes it seems like he, he just suddenly takes a complete different turn, but we realize Jesus doesn't do that, so we need to take the, make the connection in the Word. Luke chapter 11. Notice how he ended this up. Verse 13. If you then be evil or have a human nature, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So he's very plainly telling us here that the means to the receiving the power of the Holy Spirit is to ask him. It comes through our prayer life. So when our prayer life is declining, guess what's happening with the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life? It begins to decline. <coughs> See, the Bible says draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. I suppose you can flip that around and say you withdraw from me and I'll withdraw from you. I know you need these things, by the way. I'm just a good father. I'm going to bless you with a bunch of other stuff, too. 
don't do it the world's way. Now, if you do it the world's way, then you're going to get the world's answers. You say, well, what's God's way? It's verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall what? Be added unto you. In other words, he's telling them here, he's teaching them a lesson. There's two ways in this world to receive things. You can do it the way that the non-believer does. You can get out here and scratch and claw and fight and, and, and just have a dog fight and try to get be the biggest dog in the fight. Or else you can do it the kingdom way. You have not because you've asked not. <coughs> God's means of a believer receiving is through prayer. Not through scratching and clawing and fighting. Yeah, we do our part. We, we work and all that. It's not saying we don't. The Bible says, man, don't work your need. But you see, there's the kingdom way and there's the world's way. And maybe the reason that the prayer life of the believers has grown so slack is because we're too busy trying to get the stuff the world's way. How can you be too busy to pray unless you've been sucked in to try to do things the world's way? I think tomorrow I'll just call work and say, you know what, I'm too busy to work. My back is coming. But, uh, they would think you were crazy, weren't they? Why? Because in the world's eyes, that's my source. That's my bill ticket. How can I be too busy to pray when that's how I receive from God? That's how I receive the stuff. Yeah, Joe, Joe. 